Thank you, Vera. So first of all, thanks for the organizers allowing me to give a talk because I registered, I guess, probably probably at the last minute. So <laughs> um, today I want to give a talk on the um, best rank one approximation of tensors. Usually I give this talk in the, um, I guess, the tensor community of the multilinear algebra community. But you can maybe very soon you will see there's also some nice application of the metric error bounds and uh, kind of idea built in over there. Right. So I guess one can view it as application of the error bounds idea to uh, this particular line of the reset. Okay, so first of all, um, uh, let me mention that this is a based on joint work with my collaborator, Shen Long, who actually is in, also in Hangzhou as well. Okay, so let me start. So the outline of my talk would be as follows. Basically, I'm, first of all, let me briefly recall you what is the best rank one approximation for tensors. So in case uh, you haven't seen it before, I would just uh, briefly go through that. And then in particular, I'm going to uh, focus on one of the particular methods, which is called high order power method. As one of the most uh, popular methods because of the computational cost is very minimal um, because it basically just use um, a matrix product and also first order information. And uh, in particular, I'm going to look at the convergence rate analysis for this method. And finally, I hope I have time to conclude and give some remarks. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. First of all, you might be wondering what is tensors? So let me uh, just give you a very, uh, I guess, a high level kind of explanation for tensors. So essentially you could think of tensors as, uh, I mean, at least in this context, as a generalization of a matrix. So for matrix, basically that means a tensor with order two, but you can think of an order three, four, and so on. So if you think of a matrix, uh, the, the most convenient way for us to think about there's many ways. Uh, one way is to think about just as how it was described. Basically, you have a two index, say I1, I2, which is when D just two. And then for each I1, I2, you have a real number, or if it's a real matrix, okay. And then you let the index run, okay. So for a tensor, it's basically it's an extension of that. So now you have, uh, I guess, a D many uh, index, uh, I1 up to ID. And each one of the index can range from one to uh, N1, or say the, other, the second one range from one to N2 and so on. So if you collect all these uh, numbers and then it forms uh, what we call the tensor in here. Right. So depends on the situation, you might work with uh, the numbers you work on could be a real number or could be a complex number. Then you get the real tensor, sort of complex tensor. Okay, so in a nutshell, so basically you can think of as a, a multilinear extension of matrix to a higher order. So basically it's an extension of tensors to a higher order cases. Okay. And in another possible explanation is that if, if you think about matrix that corresponding to a homogeneous polynomial, then you can also think of the tensors in this way has a correspondence to the polynomial. So, so basically it is somehow you can think of as a nonlinear extension of, of matrix or nonlinear extension of the quadratic form if you think about it in that way. Okay. So that's the uh, definition. So as I said, it's basically a high order extension of matrix. And where it comes up is basically in engineering. So often they need to, uh, for example, they, when they model the video data. So essentially at each fixed time, you do a slice, you get a picture. So the picture can be encoded in a matrix. So if you let the time run, so essentially you get a third order tensor and that's what illustrated somehow in here. Okay, so basically in engineering, they view the video data as a third order tensor, uh, where the time is the additional kind of a dimension. Okay, so, uh, and uh, well, uh, as a very related uh, a kind of concept to tensor is uh, one of the very special structure tensors called rank one tensor. Just like in matrix, we have rank one matrix. Here's a natural extension as a rank one tensor. So essentially what a rank one tensor is, is a, is a very uh, specific structure tensor. And if you look at its uh, entry, say the I1 up to ID entries, it's basically you look at the I1 entry of the first vector X1 and the, uh, well, the second one will be the I2 entries of X2 and you multiply them until you get to the ID entries of XD. Okay, so when D is two, which means the order is two, you really reduce to the rank one matrix. Okay, so here's a very graphical illustration. So basically you're trying to encode the information uh, into somehow a simple kind of, uh, uh, I guess, simple structure of the tensors in here, right? Okay, 
So good. Uh, let me go on. Okay. And then the uh, one of the major, I guess, uh, major uh, problem in the uh, tensors, uh, just in the matrix case as well. So is to find the best rank uh, uh, R approximations. So in the matrix setting, you could encode a complicated matrix, maybe a high rank matrix, as somehow a sum of simple rank one matrix. And then you can encode the information into a, a simple a matrix which you can easily store. That's a general idea. Here, you, in tensors case, we always ask the same question. Okay, so basically we have a complicated tensor, see whether we can encode it into somehow tensors in smaller dimensions so that we can easily encode and store them. Okay, and that's the idea for the best rank R approximations. So essentially what happens is that, so if, I, if we have say, for example, uh, so here I need a bit of definition, basically it's a very simple, so in the product, if I have two um, tensors, they're of the same dimension, and we just define the inner product as you look at each entry of the tensor A and look at each entry of tensor B, and look at the same I1 to IB entries, multiply them together and add them all the possibilities. And that's the inner product. And from this inner product, you can easily induce a norm of this. It's usually called a, a Hilbert-Schmidt uh, norm of the tensors so in that area. And now you can look at what we call the best rank R approximation. So first of all, we're given a fixed number R, and then we look for uh, a good approximation for a given tensor A. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a sum of rank one tensors in here. Okay, and here the rank one tensor is defined by this, uh, I guess, R many, actually R times D many uh, vectors in here. Okay, and why it is good for, and as I explained before, I guess you can also imagine that. So the basic idea is that you can encode the, I mean, the, 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 the whole information of the tensor with much smaller size. So if you look at the size in here, so if you look at the original size of the tensor you want to approximate, and that's the product of ni. So ni is each dimension of the coordinates. If you think about all the ni are the same, so the dimension is n power d. So you suffer from what they call the curse of dimension, basically means when the order of the, which is d here, or the dimension n, it grows, and then the, the dimension of the tensor grows very quickly in this case. But on the other hand, if you can find the best rank r approximation, then you only need, I guess, uh, are many these block vectors in here. So think about they are all the same size. If they are all equals n, then we just d times n times r, which is much smaller than uh, n power d in general. Okay. So, uh, uh, but unfortunately, there's an important result in the area of tensors saying that this problem in general is ill-defined in the sense that this problem in general has no optimizers. And uh, actually, uh, there's a counter example stated in the, at least in the, when the degree or the order is just three. But in a nutshell, what it means is actually basically if you think about them as a polynomials, uh, the space of polynomials, those rank R uh, tensors, which those polynomial corresponding to all the possible rank R tensors is not a closed set. So in that case, it is possible that your minimizer actually locates on the boundary, which is not on the, uh, the set of, consists of the rank R tensors. So that's why the problem is in general ill-defined. Okay, but there's a very specific case as the problem is indeed well defined is in the case where the, the R you fix beforehand just what basically you look at the rank one approximations. Okay, and this problem is, 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 is well defined. And the reason is that actually you can reformulate this problem as an optimization problem, which is more <laughs> friendly to us, I guess. So you can rephrase this problem into an optimization problem. So what you have is actually so the uh, homogeneous polynomial. Uh, that corresponding to the tensor A in here, and you maximize over the product of spheres, okay? So once you look at this optimization problem, you will know that the optimizer exists. And if you can see that this problem are, are actually equivalent, then you will see that the original problem is well-defined. At least they have an optimizer, okay? Or global solution, or I would say. Here. But unfortunately, this problem itself, uh, if you are optimizers, you will see that this is actually a, a non-convex problem because the constraint is a product of spheres. So it's actually a non-convex constraint. And the problem is a maximize of a possibly non-convex polynomial over a product of sphere. So in general, actually, even in the case d equals to, uh, I would say, uh, d equals to uh, two, actually, in the, in the matrix case itself is still a non-convex optimization problem. But of course, in that case, it's much simpler, basically reduced to the eigenvalue and so on. But, okay. but on the other hand, when d is bigger than three, that's much harder, I would say. 
Okay, and in the literature, by looking at this as a non-convex optimization problem, there's a many methods for solving it. So typical methods, so you can exploit the algebraic properties of this problem because essentially this can be rephrased as a polynomial optimization problem. So the techniques in polynomial optimization literature can be applied. So you could apply the algebraic method, which works for uh, I guess modernary uh, kind of uh, uh, size of problem. And you can also use uh, semi-definite program relaxation ideas, which has done by these uh, people like, uh, um, I guess my collaborator Sheng Long over there and, uh, and also Li Chun Qi and uh, Jia Wang and uh, I guess um, his co-author Wang as well. Okay. And uh, on the other hand, you can also apply the other method, which is a first order method, which is like the uh, higher order power method, which I'm going to introduce a bit later, which is uh, uh, which proposed by uh, uh, Levin Handelberg, I think, and Dimo Benenry in early 2000. And of course, they are, you can also treat it as a, just a polynomial optimization problem as specify a special nonlinear optimization problem and then solve it as well. Okay. So, but I must say that for the algebraic method, the first two I mentioned, the first two docs I mentioned over there, they are uh, algebraic methods. They are looking for the global minimizer, a global solution. But for the third one and the fourth one in general, they're only looking for the stationary point or the local minimizer FS. Okay, but of course, the third and the fourth one are much widely used because their computational cost is minimal. And then, uh, so then people can easily compute it because in the tensors case, uh, usually they arrive at very large size problems, uh, even in the, the order D is not very large, like three or four. Okay, okay. so uh, the high order power method is one of the um, most celebrated methods in solving the best rank one approximation method. And for our optimizer, very soon you will see there's nothing but just block coordinate gradient projection algorithm. Okay, so let me explain what it is. So there's a little bit of notation in here, but um, so actually if you write it into the tensors form, it's very delicate, but uh, let me write it in terms of polynomial form so that it comes down to the more like an optimizer's point of view. So essentially given a block vector, we have what we call, this is the rank one tensor you have seen generated by this block vector. And in their literature, they call it search mapping. But what is good is actually you could, uh, for each uh, of this kind of block vector, you have a rank one tensors, you can construct an appropriate or associated uh, polynomial, which in this way, you just take the K1 component of X1, K2 component of X2 up to the KD component of XD, multiply by the associated entry of A and sum them up. Okay, and this forms you, I guess, a homogeneous polynomial, okay. And you could also have this notation, what they call the contraction in the tensor community. But what it does is actually you compute the partial derivative with respect to the ice block vector. Okay, so that's, although it's complicated in terms of its writing out, but actually just a gradient uh, or partial derivative in this case. Okay, so these are the two notions I need. Then I can formulate the algorithm. So the algorithm really looks like this. So we first choose an initial point uh, so that, um, the, whenever you take the inner product with the tensor, with this rank one uh, tensor generated by the initial point, it's actually non-zero. Actually, you can always enforce it whenever the, um, the tensor A start from is non-zero. If it's zero, then it's not that of interest usually. Okay. So start with this one. And then what we do is that actually, so here I have two loops in here. So suppose I'm stopping at the case iteration and I have updated up to the I minus one block. And to update for the I, uh, the I blocks, what I do is that you will see, I do this contraction is, which essentially what I did is I take this vector, I calculate its gradient, evaluate this uh, particular block vector, right? And I divide it by its norm. So essentially you will see this actually what is, what happens is actually we do uh, block coordinate wise gradient projection algorithm. So because we are doing maximization problem, we follow the gradient direction. Okay, so instead of the negative one, we follow the gradient direction because we're doing maximization problem. And then we project it to the unit sphere by dividing its norm. So, and then you update each block one and by fixing the other one. So it's a block coordinate wise uh, gradient projection algorithm essentially. Okay, and then we repeat the process uh, and then until the termination criterion is met. Okay, so essentially you will see there's a block coordinate wise gradient projection algorithm applied to the non-convex problem uh, with product of spheres, okay? So, so in terms of optimization point of view, this is uh, something usual or familiar for us, but the convergence study in the literature is like the following. They have convergence proof under convexity of an auxiliary functions. 
uh, they prove accumulation points uh, converging to what they call the singular vector tuples, which is essentially the critical point of the equivalent optimization problem we have seen before. They have local convergence result uh, around 2000 and also later on uh, revisit in 2012. And uh, very recently they have this uh, global convergence, which means that you can start with arbitrary initial point. Uh, first of all, they prove for generic cases and then later on that was proved uh, for arbitrary initial point by Yusmirov okay, in 2014. Okay, but then the question I'm going to pose and quickly answer is actually what about its convergence rate? Okay, so because nothing I've said about its convergence rate. And actually, um, so uh, actually the, the, the result is actually, I mean, uh, the, uh, the result is actually not a trivial because actually there's a, a group of people from uh, Germany, uh, in particular Wolfgang Hackebusch's group, they look at these particular cases for different, very specific examples. And they can see that the, for different examples, the method can exhibit sublinear convergence, linear convergence, or superlinear convergence. Okay, which means that in general, the convergence rate uh, could, may not be that trivial, I guess. All right, so that's the, and just in case I don't have enough time to present all my results, I just put out my main results in here, right? So the main result actually states the following. So if you do arbitrary initializations, so for all the tensors, uh, well, starting uh, through, uh, you actually would get sublinear convergence and you could have the convergence rate explicitly computed. And the rate is determined only on the dimension and order of the tensor, which is uh, of your data. Okay. And so if you are not satisfied with the sublinear convergence, because actually if you do random initialization, you will see you observe linear convergence. And that's explained in the second item saying that uh, if you for taking almost all tensors, remember tensor is basically a finite dimensional space. Uh, so you can look at the Lebesgue mesh in this case. So out of a set which is of Lebesgue mesh zero, you can always observe linear convergence. Okay. And finally, we have a one specific uh, class of tensors, which in the literature they call orthogonally decomposable tensors, the linear convergence always holds. Okay. And this is our general, uh, I might, the, the main result, the paper actually. Okay. And let's see how we do it. And let me start with, uh, and if I'm not sure what to start with, I guess it's good to start with the lit existing literature. So uh, I guess the most uh, one I, I pick up with is actually Yusmirov's result because that's the, uh, the most uh, recent one when I pick it up at that time. So Yusmirov uh, proved the global convergence and in his proof, the idea is basically he constructed a, uh, I call it a merit function in the paper. So, and then he argued that the uh, the high order power mass can be, the convergence of that can be uh, looking at uh, the behavior for this merit function. And this merit function just formed by taking the uh, norm of A minus the rank one tensor tau X norm squared. Okay, so essentially this is what they're looking at. And, and the key to for him to uh, derive the global convergence result is basically the Loyasvis A equality. So, which basically says that how the, gradient of a function is bounded below by the function value itself around a given uh, reference point. Okay, so that's what uh, happens. And uh, unfortunately, uh, if you want to say the convergence rate, you must estimate somehow the exponent of this Loyasvis inequality, which is in general hard to do. Okay, but um, unfortunately in the polynomial cases, uh, there's, uh, there's some hope over there. And let me quote some results over there. But before that, let me convince you that that's possible in a polynomial case, because you can look at a very one simple dimensional cases, which is x power d, and then you compute gradient. And then you can see that the gradient is bounded below by the function value with a suitable power that depends on the degree of the polynomials in here. Okay, and of course, this is a one dimensional one. You didn't see the dimension plays a role, but in general, the dimension also plays a role as well. Okay, so let me just quickly give you a flash on this Loyasvis air qualities result. For polynomials, there's a, a one very powerful result derived by the uh, Akunto and Kruka. So what they've shown is that without any regularity and conditions, so essentially by just doing translation, you can assume that F0 is zero, gradients vanish. You can have the Loyasvis air quality with a very specific or explicit uh, exponent here that in terms of the degree and the dimension n. Okay. And of course you can extend it to uh, the semi-algebraic cases, which means uh, for example, maximum of finite many polynomials or minimum 
fundamental polynomials. Uh, maybe sometimes under a strict minimizer assumptions by Janos Kohler, one of the famous uh, algebraic uh, geometer, and also Kruka himself. And together with John and Liang Jin, uh, we look at the convex case, uh, but dropping the strict minimized assumptions. And later on, uh, together with Boris and Fan, uh, we look at the non-convex case as well, but we get a weaker estimate. But on the other hand, in the very structured cases, uh, for example, in the sparse optimization cases, you can actually get the exponent just one half, which you get linear convergence in that cases, which is a, a recent work with Tin K as well. Okay, so now you see that, so now that very naturally you will expect, okay, we just apply the De, uh, De Kunta and Kutka's results together with what uh, we done, uh, we have seen in Yusmirov's result, you immediately get what you want. And this is essentially the basic idea, but we just do a minor twist. So instead of directly applying the uh, Yusmirov's uh, Marif functions, uh, we do what is more familiar with our optimizers. We do the Lagrangian function. Okay, so remember this is the optimized equivalent optimization problem we do. So we take the minus of the objective functions because we do a maximization problem. We multiply by the norm of xi minus one with the Lagrange multiplier mu and sum up for the d blocks. That forms the Lagrangian function. The only difference uh, in here is that we treat the Lagrange multiplier also as a variable here, okay? So the numeric function has an advantage comparing to the previous result because if you look at the degree, so the in, I guess, use mirrors result, the degree is 2D, while in here, the degree just, uh, I guess, here the degree is two, and here the degree is D. So at most the degree is, is D in here. So the degree is actually half of the degree, which was used in use mirrors uh, result, okay? So finally, you will see essentially that's what we get. So you can get the uh, sublinear convergence rate by applying the D Kuntas uh, and Kukas result. Uh, combining with using mirror of the technique by uh, using a different memory function in here. Okay, so that's the result we get in here, and that's actually the roadmap of the proof. Okay, so but you will see that that's what we did over there. Okay, so then let me quickly just compare with uh, <laughs> uh, what we uh, in the literature. So, first of all, it is sharper than you directly apply using mirror of the result. And in terms of the convergence rate, actually is, I would say, suboptimal from optimization point of view, because first of all, uh, without any condition in Amir Beck's uh, paper, it was shown that uh, this block coordinate descent method, which is the, well, in this case, is uh, the higher order power method is, is a block coordinate gradient descent method. Uh, without any condition, you actually get one over K of rate, but our rate is actually sharper than that because we make use of the polynomial structure. And of course, it's not the optimal one because we uh, probably uh, known in the optimization literature that the, for the first order method, the optimal rate is one over k squared. But the optimal rate is often achieved by doing the extrapolation step, but we are not doing the extrapolation step in here. So from that sense, uh, the, result, uh, the, op the rate we obtain here is a suboptimal one. So. Okay, and of course, the sublinear convergence rate decrease quickly when the dimension n and d grows. All right, so then let me quickly move on to linear convergence. Okay, so linear convergence, uh, so basically what we do is that uh, we will need some uh, uh, a notation for non-degeneracy. So essentially uh, what we do is that, remember this is the, uh, in the equivalent optimization problem, this is the objective function you have seen over there. We will need a notion of a non-degeneracy over there. So the non-degeneracy basically, the, I mean the, um, the notion is basically with, uh, taken from in the differential geometry. So what we do is that we will need uh, the manifold gradient, which what we do is to take the geodesic curve, take the derivative, evaluate t equals zero. That means the uh, manifold gradient at the point X. And you can also do the manifold Hessian. Basically you take the geodesic curve, take the second order derivative, evaluate t equals zero. And when we say it is non-degenerate, basically we mean the corresponding manifold Hessian is the, the matrix is actually non-degenerate, okay? So that's what we mean over there. So under the non-degeneracy condition, you can prove actually you have a linear convergence, okay? And the proof actually really goes on to argue that the non-degeneracy implies the Loyasuris inequality with exponent one half, okay? So, uh, and, but I guess more interestingly is actually we show that uh, actually for almost all tenses, the all the singular vector tuples actually non-degenerate. Basically tells you that all the critical points of the equivalent optimization problem is 
non-degenerate as a result. Uh, for almost all the tensors, uh, the high order power method converges in a linear way. And the tools we use basically is more theory as you can expect. It. Okay, so basically we apply the more theory applied to the unit sphere. So that's all we do. Okay, and finally we have a deterministic example, which is for the orthogonal decomposable tensors, which actually get linear convergence without the generic assumptions. So for the orthogonal decomposable tensors, basically it's a tensor that you written into this way. Uh, so you can, you can written as a sum of lambda i of the rank one tensors and each one of them, uh, if you take out these corresponding vectors, they form an orthogonal matrix, okay? So in the matrix case, that's basically the orthogonal decomposition of a matrix in that sense. Okay, so in that case, we actually show that for this particular class, all the singular value tuple, or in that case, all the uh, critical points of the equivalent optimization problem are actually non-degenerate. And as a result, for this class, you always have linear convergence. Okay, and I must say that, uh, so for this, um, when we uh, look at the non-degeneracy of the, all the singular value tuples, we didn't aware that there's a, a group of algebraic geometry people. They also look at the same questions uh, and they use their algebraic method to derive the same result. And I must say that their result, I, would, I have great respect to their result and actually very elegant using their tools. But I must say they use their algebraic geometry tools while, while we just basically verify directly from linear algebra point of view, calculate the Hessian matrix of the manifold Hessian and verify the Hessian is not singular. Okay, so I think I will be concluding. So, <laughs> okay, so hopefully I convince you that uh, uh, the uh, rank one approximation problem for tensors is an interesting problem. So actually they have a, pro a lot of applications in engineering, particularly for the video data. And one of the methods they use is high order power methods. And we, in particular, we basically look at the convergence rate of the high order power methods. And the fundamental tool we use is basically identify the Loyasovitz air quality exponents and look at the appropriate, um, I guess, the memory function. Okay. And there's a lot of question can be asked, uh, for example, uh, in the asymptotic convergence rate, uh, we don't know the proportional constant and how to estimate it is actually a big question. Actually, uh, even in the, well, I guess in the linear case, how to estimate the Hoffman constant is also a challenging uh, topic as well. Not to mention in the much more complicated cases. And also there are many variants of the high order power methods. Uh, for example, you can use uh, um, alternating least squares with acceleration techniques, which has done in this, a uh, paper later on by Guan Chu uh, and another Chu in the 2018 and so on. And whether this kind of techniques can be applied to their method is also an interesting question. So with that, I should stop. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Guin. So just before we ask questions, I would like to remind everybody that right after questions, we're going to take a photo. So please be ready to turn your camera on for the snapshot. So uh, now let's uh, let 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 discuss some questions. Who who would like to ask a question? Please just start talking if you have a question. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Please, Bruno. Uh, first, thank you very much for your very nice talk. So ju just out of curiosity, have people uh, taking a look of trying to do this uh, to find this best rank at I, I don't, I'm not even sure if it makes sense, but requiring that the vectors be non-negative or something like that. Ah, uh, yes. So it's a very good question. There's also a uh, another interesting question is to find the best rank one approximation also require that each vector to be non-negative. They call it non-negative best rank one approximation. Actually, my collaborator has a paper, I think just appeared this year. Um, okay. uh, actually, it's exactly on this uh, question. I think he published it with Defong on sign matrix this year, I think. So they particularly look at a case which they have additional requirement that each vector they look at when they do the decomposition has to be non-negative. I see. And in, in that case, uh, does, does some of the technique or some of the analysis techniques uh, are they vastly different? Or do you expect that some of the analysis you, you've done here could also be done 
Um, I would expect the analysis uh, has been done in here was also used there. I, actually, I think they did use the, some of the analysis used in this paper over there. But I guess the more, I think the difficulty is more in the computational side because they need to uh, satisfy both the non-activity and also the, uh, on the sphere as well. So in that case, they don't have analytic solution. So because when you project to the sphere, you have an analytic mm -hmm. solution. But when you project down to the sphere and intersect with a non-active osteront, and uh, the projection actually is more delicate, I, mean, I think, in that cases. Okay. So like, I think their, their difficulty is more in the numerical side, I would think. I see. Thank you. OK, any more, any more questions? Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> if no one has an to the question, I think I want to ask another one. Okay, yeah, sure. go not ahead. A, not a problem. Uh, so it, it was actually based on what you've just answered. So instead of uh, instead of having spheres, if I had some set for which I could uh, project, could I still use the same uh, techniques? Um, I think for the sublinear convergence, you could essentially use the similar techniques. That's not a problem. But for the linear convergence in here, we actually use a lot of the structure of the sphere. So because actually we use the, because one of the things is the sphere forms a manifold, first of all, and then we can apply the more theory in this context. So in the other cases, which I'm not particularly sure if you look at the linear convergence, uh, I mean, but I would think I could imagine that for the sublinear convergence result, uh, as long as they are, can be described by uh, polynomial inequalities, I think the similar kind of techniques could be applied in that context. But I'm not entirely sure in the case of a linear convergence uh, result. I see. Uh, thank you very much. Right, thank you. So thank you very much, Green, again.